this video we will review some facts about Nebraska. But before we start, please like this video, comment which video you want to see next and subscribe to our channel for future updates. Nebraska is sometimes overshadowed by its neighboring states, although it has its own historical significance. It also made significant and amazing contributions to the USA, which everyone should be aware of. Learn more about Nebraska with these 50 facts. Nebraska has a distinct geographical landscape. South Dakota is to the north, Iowa is to the east, Missouri, Kansas, and Colorado are to the south, and Wyoming is to the west. The state also features three significant rivers, the most notable of which being the Platte River, which runs west to east across central Nebraska. The Niobrara River runs across northern Nebraska, while the Republican River runs through southern Nebraska. The dissected till plains characterize eastern Nebraska's landscape, with gently sloping hills left behind from the ice ages, which crushed the soil under glaciers. The majority of Nebraska, however, is part of North America's Great Plains. The climate in the state is similarly diverse. The majority of Nebraska has a humid continental climate with warm and humid summers and frigid winters. Western Nebraska, on the other hand, has a humid subtropical climate with hot and humid summers and moderate winters. Instead, the area of southern Nebraska bordering Colorado has a semi-arid climate. This results in scorching, dry summers and relatively cold winters in that location. The state receives around 800 mm of rain each year on average. Temperatures range from a high of 48 degrees Celsius in the summer to a low of 44 degrees below zero in the winter. The state is also in Tornado Alley in the United States, with most tornadoes occurring in the spring or summer, although they can also strike in the autumn. It also features a number of state parks and woods. The Agate Fossil Beds National Monument, located near the community of Harrison in Nebraska's Sioux County, is one of them. The National Monument, which covers an area of 12 kilometers too, is located in the valley of the Niobrara River. It gets its name from its abundant fossil deposits, which date back to the Miocene Epoch, which lasted between 20 and 16 million years ago. The National Monument was declared by the US government in 1997, but its presence has been authorized since 1965. The Nebraska National Forest, which encompasses 574 kilometers too, is another protected region in Nebraska. The US Forest Service, founded in 1908, purposefully developed three smaller and former national forests, the Dismal River, Niobrara, and North Platte National Forests, into the contemporary Nebraska National Forest. Water formerly covered the majority of what is now Nebraska. This occurred between 99 and 66 million years ago, during the Cretaceous period. The Western Interior Seaway spanned a third of what would become the United States at the time. The floods finally receded between 5 and 2 million years ago, during the Pliocene Epoch. Nebraska was submerged for millions of years, leaving behind abundant fossil relics. These include ancient sharks such as Squalocorax and other fishes such as Enchidus. Invertebrates such as ammonites, mollusks, and even plankton have been discovered as fossils. Aquatic dinosaurs such as ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs also left remains in Nebraska. Nebraska was also buried under ice during previous ice ages. They established this pattern roughly 3 million years ago, during the Pleistocene Epoch. The glaciers left their imprint on the terrain, notably in eastern Nebraska, mostly as low hills with thick, clay soils. They also left behind random rocks transported by glacial ice far from the mountains and left behind after the ice melted in the lowlands. However, the glaciers receded with the conclusion of each ice age, allowing Nebraska to experience broad plant and animal life expansion between ice ages. Prehistoric camels, monkeys, rhinoceros, and possibly tigers were among the animals found in Nebraska at the time. In the 17th century, Native Americans reacted violently to Spanish explorers. In 1720, Pedro de Villazur set out from Santa Fe, following a Native American track farther into North America. Later that year, he arrived in Nebraska and was compelled to fight the Pawnees. De Villazur and the majority of his troops were killed in the conflict, with just one monk managing to escape and report the devastation to the Spanish colonies to the south. Despite his failure, de Villazur managed to accomplish the pinnacle of Spanish exploration of North America's interior. Nonetheless, the Spanish colonial authorities spent the next seven years researching and blaming the accident. It also signaled the end of Spanish advance into North America's interior, with the French seizing the opportunity to further their own colonial aspirations. Nebraska was historically a part of considerably larger U.S. territories. 
For starters, the state is part of the huge Louisiana Territory, which the United States purchased from Spain in 1803. Louisiana eventually became a separate state, leaving the rest of the area as an unorganized territory. The Kansas and Nebraska territories were established by the U.S. Congress in 1854. The latter remained larger than the contemporary state and continued to decline in the years that followed. As the U.S. Congress continued with the territorial land restructuring, this resulted in more territory losses. Colorado, Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota, and Wyoming were created as a result of this. Nebraska historically had the first U.S. military installation west of the Missouri River. Fort Atkinson, in particular, was named after Colonel Henry Atkinson, who conducted an expedition to record the Yellowstone River's course and adjacent territories. The U.S. Army erected Fort Atkinson in 1819 to support that expedition, but the fort ironically struggled in its early years. So much so that the garrison nearly starved to death due to a food scarcity during the winter of 1819-1820. Things improved after that, and the fort was only attacked once. This occurred in 1823, when garrisons launched raids on Arakara settlements in reaction to Native American attacks on supply convoys. Until its closure in 1827, the fort's most famous accomplishment was meteorological research for the U.S. government. The fort was thereafter abandoned until the 1960s, when the state government took steps to preserve it. Despite being declared a National Historic Landmark in 1961, budgetary constraints meant that repair would not begin until the 1980s. The 1850s witnessed the start of widespread American colonization in the region. Farmers gradually moved into the area during the decade, but immigration and settlement did not fully take off until 1859. The explanation for this, ironically, occurred in Wyoming, when settlers discovered gold. This led to individuals believing they could discover gold throughout the central United States, causing settlers to stream into Nebraska and its neighbors. Following the vast deportation of Native Americans before to, during, and after the Civil War, the U.S. government pushed this even more in the early 1860s. They then auctioned off the stolen Native American lands to potential settlers. The significant U.S. Army presence throughout different forts in the region was also an inducement, as it offered a sense of safety and security. During the Civil War, Nebraska made a variety of contributions to the Union. Originally, Nebraska only formed one regiment, and the Territory Administration had no intention of sending them to participate in the war. Instead, with U.S. Army regulars fighting in the conflict, the regiment would guard the land from Native American raids. However, the region eventually established more regiments, with the original 1st Regiment also entering the fight after the territory was safe. A total of 3,000 Nebraskans served in the conflict, divided across one infantry unit and three cavalry regiments. Nebraska also formed multiple militia units, which primarily took over home defense duties. There were no conflicts in Nebraska because the Confederacy saw no need to invade it. Only 35 Nebraskans died in fighting during the war, while another 204 perished as a result of accidents or illnesses. Following the Civil War, Nebraska's statehood was surrounded by controversy. This was due to the fact that Nebraska's original constitution purposefully limited voting privileges to whites. As a result, Nebraska's statehood was delayed since the U.S. Congress declined to approve the aforementioned constitution in the aftermath of the Civil War. Nebraska was not granted statehood until a year later, in 1867. Even then, they had to alter the constitution to give non-whites the right to vote. Out of pro-white supremacist inclinations, U.S. President Andrew Johnson rejected Nebraska's draft state constitution. As a result, the Republican-dominated supermajority in the United States Congress overruled his veto. 
This would be remembered as one of several clashes between the Democratic president and the Republican Congress at the time. It also made Nebraska the only state in the United States to obtain statehood in the face of a presidential veto. Nebraska was heavily struck by the Great Depression. Grain and cattle prices plummeted by 50% at the outset of the crisis, creating significant losses in the agriculture sector, which was the state's basis. The downward trend continued in the years that followed, with prices reaching their lowest point in history in 1932. The state government exacerbated matters by refusing to seek assistance from the federal government. Their denial, however, became moot by 1933, when the U.S. Congress approved the Federal Emergency Relief Act, FERA. This allowed federal money to flood into Nebraska, which was aided by the election of a new state administration in 1935. That year also saw the implementation of a new state social security statute, which aided recovery. During World War II, Nebraska also made several contributions to the American military effort. Ironically, few Nebraskans served in the U.S. military during World War II, preferring to stay at home and contribute in other ways. Nebraska contributed much of the food required to feed U.S. troops and their allies across the world. They also worked in state-built enterprises that produced military weaponry and ammunition. Grand Husker's Corn Husker Ordnance Plant, COP, was one of the largest, and ironically, it was run by the Quaker Oats Company. The COP also let women to work at the plant, and its parent business implemented a daycare program to encourage more women to enter the workforce. At its peak, women comprised up to 40% of the COP's staff. Following the war, Nebraska saw significant changes. These included a new tax structure that replaced existing state property taxes with sales and income taxes. Highways, mental institutions, public housing, and waste treatment plants all grew in popularity across the state. All of this meant that when the agriculture crisis of the 1980s hit, Nebraska fared better than the other states. The state's new motorways, in particular, enticed investors, and the little industry thrived in lieu of numerous bankrupted farms. Telecommunications eclipsed food processing as Nebraska's largest employer as the economy diversified. By the turn of the century, Nebraska was also able to compete with global telecom behemoths like India. In 2007, a mass shooting occurred in Nebraska. Robert Hawkins came into a Von Moore department store on December 5th, that year, carrying a semi-automatic weapon. He opened fire on the third level, killing eight people and injured another six before taking his own life. Hawkins was diagnosed with ADHD and PTSD as a result of family troubles, according to the report. Hawkins allegedly sent a suicide note to the local police station, according to the investigators. Other concerns in his history include a broken relationship with a girlfriend and a job loss due to workplace theft. In reaction to the incident, Von Moore temporarily suspended operations, while Hawkins' family expressed sympathy and even delivered a public apology to all of his victims. Nebraska's population is varied. Whites account for an estimated 88% of Nebraska's population. German Americans account for the majority of whites, an estimated 36%, followed by Irish Americans, 13%. Nebraska also boasts the most Czech American and Danish American residents of any U.S. state. African Americans are Nebraska's second largest ethnic group, accounting for an estimated 5% of the population. 
Asian Americans come in third, accounting for an estimated 3% of the population, followed by Native Americans, who account for an estimated 1%. Other ethnic groups are projected to account for 5% of the population. In addition, mixed and multiracial people account for an estimated 7% of the population. The same is true for the faiths of the state. At 51% of the population, the majority of Nebraskans adhere to various Protestant religions. Roman Catholics are second at 23%, with Mormons, Hindus, and Buddhists each accounting for 1% of the population. Other religions, such as Islam, account for an additional 2% of the total population. Other Christian faiths, such as Eastern Orthodoxy, are included. A further 1% of Nebraska's population admits to not knowing what religion they practice. Finally, there are people who are not affiliated with any religion and account for an estimated 20% of the state's population. Omaha, Nebraska's largest city, dates back to the 17th century. Native Americans resided on the ground where the city will later be built during the time. The Omaha and the Ponca, in particular. The former would subsequently share the city's name. The name Omaha is a corruption of the Native American Omoho or Umaha, which means, dwellers on the bluff. The place was first visited by Americans in 1804, when Lewis and Clark traveled through it on their way to the Pacific Ocean. They also spoke with local Native American officials, including Missouri and Oto tribal chiefs. Over the next several decades, trading ports and army forts sprung up all over the surrounding countryside. Omaha as we know it now emerged in the mid-19th century. The Mormons attempted to occupy the location for the first time in 1846, establishing an encampment known as Cutler's Park in August of that year. However, by December of that year, they had abandoned the encampment. The permanent settlement began only in 1854, after the U.S. Congress established the Nebraska Territory. William Brown of the Lone Tree Ferry made history by transporting the majority of the city's original immigrants. He also supplied the vision that inspired the settlers to establish a city in the region on July 4, 1854, at Capitol Hill. Today, Omaha Central High School stands on the original location of the city. Omaha grew rapidly in the mid and late 19th centuries. This was due to the city's location on the Missouri River, which provided convenient access to long-distance transportation. Omaha also made early investments in railways, which, together with the stockyards used to store commodities along the riverfront, provided a plethora of jobs that lured people to the city. As the city's population and economy developed, so did demand for new services and infrastructure. The wealthy upper class had created private enclaves to the north and south by the 1880s, such as the Gold Coast. The masses benefited from large-scale public transportation, with trams crossing the city entirely by the 1890s. In 1881, a flood ravaged the city. The Great Flood of 1881, which swept down the entire Missouri River Valley. The flood began in South Dakota and grew in power as it swept into Iowa, Missouri, and Nebraska. During the worst of the storm, nearly to 8 kilometers of Omaha were submerged. Even yet, downtown Omaha was submerged for weeks before the river recovered to its usual depth. Fortunately, just two individuals perished when they leaped off a boat that had been swept away by the river. However, the city was damaged to the tune of millions of dollars.
Even the precise number is unknown today, owing to the disordered records left behind by the flood. Throughout the late 19th century, racial and economic violence erupted throughout the city. The 1882 Camp Dump Strike is notable because the state government called the troops to assist the Burlington Yard's business in putting down striking railroad employees. The infuriated lower classes retaliated indiscriminately against everyone known to have assisted in putting the strike down. This compelled the U.S. Army to interfere, but the class violence was so deadly that they had to send machine guns and even a cannon. Racial violence was no less hazardous, as evidenced by the case of Joe Coe in 1891. He was accused of raping a white girl and was at the mercy of the crowd, who stormed the courthouse where he was on trial. The racist police, who were sympathetic to the mob, stood by and did nothing as the crowd carried Joe Co out to be lynched. In the early 20th century, racial tensions in the city intensified. Ironically, this was largely due to firms recruiting African Americans to provide security, specifically to put down strikers. As a result, Lower-class whites saw African Americans in general as criminals eager to take money from the wealthy to perform their dirty job. The 1909 Greek town riot demonstrated that racial tensions spread to other nationalities. A 3,000-person mob would burn down Greek town and a Greek neighborhood in southern Omaha during the riot. Another lynching occurred in 1919, this time against Willie Brown, who was suspected of raping a white lady. This caused the U.S. Army to intervene once more, crushing the disturbance and protecting the city's African-American community from a wave of lynchings. In 1913, the city was also damaged by a tornado. Specifically, the Omaha Easter Sunday tornado, which was part of a larger tornado surge that year across the United States. The tornado that devastated Omaha occurred between March 21st and 23, with the last day also serving as Easter Sunday. In addition to exceeding 370 km per hour winds, the tornado created a trail of damage through the city that was almost 800 meters wide. 94 people were killed, while another 400 were injured. The storm also destroyed over 2,000 residences and cost $6 million in damage. Many more people perished as a result of the tornado's aftermath, which was followed by a cold front. The city's economy deteriorated in the late 20th century. Omaha gained immensely during World War II as aircraft manufacturers established plants in the city to manufacture warplanes for the U.S. military. Following the war, food manufacturing grew as the post-war U.S. population boosted demand for food. However, by the 1960s, racial tensions in the city had driven large corporations out. Race riots, in particular, inflicted significant damage to the city's industrial regions on several occasions. As a result, industrial firms saw working in the city as a long-term burden. Omaha's economic woes were exacerbated by the widespread fall of the U.S. railroad sector. Food processing business in the city has declined due to competition from other states. Omaha has had an infrastructure boom in the 21st century. These featured new buildings in downtown Omaha, such as the 193-meter-tall One First National Center, which was erected in 2002. There's also the CenturyLink Center, which opened in 2008, and the adjoining TD Ameritrade Park, which opened in 2011. The latter was eventually called Charles Swab Field Omaha and while confined to 24,000 seats, has a seating capacity of 35,000.
Omaha has also begun new housing developments, such as the Riverfront Place condos, which were developed between 2006 and 2011. The city has also made investments in public infrastructure, such as the Bob Kerry Pedestrian Bridge, which opened to foot and bicycle traffic in 2008. Several industries continue to exist in Nebraska today. Cool headquarters aides are still in Hastings, where Edwin Perkins started the firm in 1927. The city takes great pleasure in this, and annual Cool Aid Days are held every second week of August. The remainder of Nebraska shares this pride, with Cool Aid serving as the state drink. Hornady, a significant maker of ammunition not just for the U.S. military but also for the civilian weapons market, is another big Nebraskan company. Union Pacific also runs the world's largest train yard, the Bailey Yard in North Platte City. Kawasaki also maintains plants in Nebraska where they manufacture ATVs, jet skis, and the Mule Utility Vehicle Series. The state's energy economy is unusually varied. Aside from being the second largest producer of ethanol-based biofuels in the United States, Nebraska also has its own minor oil sector, producing oil from the Niobrara Formation in western Nebraska. The state also has a uranium mine on its northwest border with Wyoming. Nebraska is also the only U.S. state in which the state owns all electricity generation. Although coal is used to generate half of the state's power, the state has realized the need to move forward. Investments in numerous green energy sources are included, although agricultural issues have made wind the most preferred green energy source in Nebraska. It also has an excellent infrastructure network. For starters, 18 U.S. routes travel through the state as they cross the continent. Similarly, the state operates six interstate routes for vehicular travel throughout the state. Amtrak, Canadian National Railway, and even the Iowa Interstate Railroad provide transportation services throughout the state. Nebraska also has various airports, the largest of which being Eppley Airfield near Omaha. There's also Lincoln Airport, which is located in the city of the same name and is the state's second largest. Lincoln Airport also has the distinction of serving both the civilian and military sectors. The Nebraska Air National Guard namely, which operates the 155th Air Refueling Wing from Lincoln Airport. The state takes part in a variety of sports. The Nebraska Bug Eaters FC, which represents the state in the United Premier Soccer League, is one of them. Omaha City FC, which solely plays indoor soccer in the Premier Arena Soccer League, operates similarly. Omaha Heart which participates in the Legends Football League, and Omaha Beef, which competes in the Champions Indoor Football, are two more teams. There's also Union Omaha, who plays in USL League One, and the Lincoln Salt Dogs, who play in the Independent American Association. Finally, the Omaha Storm Chasers of the Pacific Coast League of Triple A Minor League Baseball represent Nebraska. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe to our channel, since we will be covering a lot of similar content in the future. Till next time, stay curious.